often people attack me and say you are looking too much for the species and you have to look more for the whole habitat and my answer is always the species told me the whole story about the habitat forest means for me at first beauty at second best job for me first <laughs> What really makes, makes me click is to prove that doing the right thing for the forest and doing the right thing for the business can actually be the same thing. This story revolves around this tree, the Norway spruce, an impressive tree that can grow its straight stem up to 60 meters tall and live for over 300 years. Originally native to Europe, it is today also found in both Asia and North America and considered one of the most commercially important wood species in the world. Favored by foresters for its fast-growing and solid wood, it is an important multi-billion dollar industry that supplies wood and wood-derived products to all corners of the globe. So far so good, and this probably could have been the end point of the story if it wasn't for one tiny little problem. Tiny as in around 3 millimeters in size. All the spruce are gone, you can see why. Bark beetles, bark beetle trails. Bark beetles are little tiny bugs that live under tree bark. That's why they're called bark beetles. It just so happens that the conifer feeding bark beetles contain a few species that can kill trees. And people, people's industries are also interested in the same tree species. Dr. Yeri Halser is an entomologist at the University of Florida who has specialized in bark beetles. I was born a bug nerd and I feel like this science of forest bugs plays a pretty important role. It allows me to be right between the world of people and the world of nature and see both. These tiny beetles have in recent years been responsible for a massive global destruction of coniferous forests. Yuri now travels all over the world to collect and study these insects in an effort to understand how such a small animal is all of a sudden able to cause all this damage. Yuri grew up here in Czechia and is back with his family to visit the forest where his interest in nature first started and to meet up with forest owners who are seeing the effects of the bark beetle outbreaks on the forest firsthand. And the bark beetle scars are eerily obvious. There are more than 6,000 species of bark beetles in the world, and it should be noted that most of them do not cause any problems. The species of particular interest now is called Ips typographus, or simply the spruce bark beetle. Despite having been a native part of European forests for millennia, major outbreaks in the last couple of decades have destroyed coniferous forests both around Europe and other parts of the world, and it is therefore now considered a pest insect of major global economic importance. And that means that instead of uh, having something like 12 million cubic meters of uh, wood production in Norway spruce per year in the Czech Republic, last year, two years ago, three years ago, we had three times more dead wood, uh, sick wood. So prices have collapsed. Uh, we still have hard years ahead of us. But there seems to be a twist to this dilemma. Well, the truth is that bark bees don't really like living healthy trees. They really need the trees to be a little bit stressed, or a lot stressed. And this is where the complexity of the problem begins. Basically, this is the one model where a forest is a manufacturer for wood. You see only one type of tree, it's only Norway spruce. The second thing is you basically see only one age class, they're all the same height. Some are weaker, some are stronger, but they were all born in the same year, more or less. For bark beetles, that's a buffet. If you plant the same tree, dense, same age, and then they get stressed when the trees are big, that's a perfect beginning of a bark beetle outbreak. 
Traditionally, spruce forestry involves growing the trees as a single species and single age class forest for between 80 to 100 years, and then clear cut to make space for the next spruce forest to be planted. This method makes planning and harvest simple to manage, but financial profits largely delayed until the trees are mature enough to be cut. It just so happens that this is also the age of trees preferred by bark beetles. Combine that with other increasingly frequent environmental stressors like extended drought periods, more frequent storms, or long periods of unusual temperatures, and the bark beetle smorgasbord is set. Generally, if we cut 100 years old trees, they were planted by the old generations of foresters, and we use these products. Now, if the climate change is coming and we don't know how is the site condition over 100 years, it's a risk to create the even-aged monocultures. So you see, if you have a, a monospecific culture, then disease can turn very quickly into an epidemic. Uh, that's a problem. Whoa. Imagine this as an investment. Imagine that you've been growing this. You've been growing this for 60 to 80 years. Of course, it was planted before the whole climate change. They had no clue that weather's gonna be different. It was easy to plant dense plantations of one species. Things are different now. So in other words, we made the outbreaks. It turns out that a major cause of the recent years of bark beetle destruction is linked to a combination of events making conditions extremely favorable for the beetle. Increasing environmental changes putting stress on the trees, growing the trees for a long time to maximize yield, and single species forests facilitating the reproduction and spread of the bark beetles. So perhaps rather than thinking about the beetles as the mean cause of death, Perhaps we should start thinking about them as a symptom of tree death. As a national park, our area is the national park, but of course we are interested to share the knowledge from the national park with a broad array of people working somewhere in private forest, in state forest. So bark beetle was something of the National Park Bavarian Forest in Germany. When people were interested to see huge bark beetle areas, they came to the National Park. This was in the 90s. Nowadays, the bark beetles are everywhere active. And now the people are coming to the National Park and say, we are interested in your lessons learned. I'm, I'm trained as a, forest, as a forester. And now I work as an ecologist, so I have a perspective on both sides. I sold a lot of wood in my, my uh, early career, and I was driving through the forest just checking the trees, how valuable they are. And now I totally shifted my perspective, and now I drive to, through the forest and ch look only where are they rotten, and new habitat for rare species. You have to, to keep in mind that a forest owner in Germany 95% of the income is from wood. So there is no wonder that wood is their target. Is their, this is by far the major income. Uh, but uh, for me, the interesting thing is how can we improve the compromise? A national park forest and a forest managed for commercial purposes may at first seem like two very different things, yet both important and valuable in their own ways. But the bark beetle dilemma opened up some questions. Could there be a commercial value in including a natural value? You have those stands that are all same age, uh, 78 years old. Again, here you have a slot where we've created a half hectare hole where we have planted beech. So we are reintroducing uh, a species that belongs here, but because this was monoculture, had basically disappeared. The core is to be humble. Uh, and being humble ecologically, nature-wise, means diversification. 
and uh, diversity of type of wood and diversity of age classes. So we break this huge monoculture forest into little bits where we you know, put a splash of uh, beach or we create a hole so that uh, smaller Norway spruce grows and uh, after a few years you still have the big stems up there but underneath you have 20 years of regrowth that is prepared for the future. A shift is in process. Knowledge gathered from research on natural forests is being implemented on production forests. Traditional single species, single age class monocultures are being phased out and forestry businesses are going back to raising forests as a forest ecosystem. And in doing so, reducing many of the financial and ecological risks involved in monoculture forests. It is a system where biodiversity and financial profits are no longer on opposite sides and instead both benefiting from the other. Selective and continuous logging eliminates the need for clear cuts and when one tree is taken down, natural regrowth of younger individuals are ready to take its place, thus shortening the time for the next tree to be ready for harvest. This new practice also allows for the trees to be cut sooner and further reduce the risk of more bark beetle outbreaks. To be honest, nothing is really new, but now of course we have much better data and can show with more evidence uh, and even we can incorporate scenarios of climate change which we were not really aware of. Forest, uh, what do you work with? You work with uh, light, air, water and soil. Three of those four are for free. So if you can use light by using shadow and light to generate regrowth, nature is reconstructing your forest for free for you. If you can use water and ensure that you retain it so that you have enough water when you need it, where you need it, again, it's for free. Uh, and nature is working for you and is doing the right thing for herself ecologically, but also the right thing for you business-wise. The only thing that costs money is soil, so you should invest in soil, and people, machines, gasoline. So the less you use people, gasoline, machines, and the more you make wa uh, water, air, light and soil work for you, the better you are. What does that mean? It means that for us, managing closer to nature is a good business proposition. And on top of that, it's nice. Practices are also put in place to minimize the impact on soil quality and regrowth. Heavy machinery are often necessary in forestry, but here, in places and times when it is possible, they have been replaced with horses that round up the timber before being transported out. And natural decomposition is encouraged to further improve soil quality and provide habitat for even more forest species. All in an effort to decrease the impact on forest soil and in the long run more cost effective as less financial input is needed to prepare the soil for the next generation of forest. The bark beetle destruction was and still is a major hit to forests around the world, but in some ways it may also have brought some good with it. You know, nature is changing, we see it every day. Uh, society is changing, markets are changing. There's no wonder that people percept this beetle as a pest, because from the economic point of view, it is a pest. In the national park, uh, when you are not interested in e economy, then it's just an ecosystem engineer. DNA studies done by Yuri and his team are finding that forests hit badly by the bark beetle outbreaks are recovering at an astonishing rate. But the tiny bark beetle has forced us to re-evaluate what a forest is. Forests are unique in that they can combine the values of beauty, spirituality, biodiversity, and profit. Wood is without a doubt a material of the future and an important renewable resource. And production forests are exceptional in that they are able to fulfill many of the values from both society and the forest owners. The foresters we have met are clearly proud to be part of building the new generation of the industry where production forests and natural diversity can actually be linked. And all in part thanks to a little pest insect. I think an open mind in forestry is, uh, is absolutely needed nowadays. And it's interesting because I can feel now when I walk in the forest that the forest feels different. Forest is a cycle of 150 years. But 20 years is enough to make it different.